Well, I believe that the family is the greatest show on earth. It really is. We are taming wild beasts, juggling responsibilities, spinning plates, all kinds of obligations and things going on at the same time. And I, I tell you, I love the circus. When I think about the family, I think about the circus because the circus has so much energy. I mean, there's those three rings over here. You've got the little people on top of each other's shoulders, you know, riding the elephants. And over there, you got the monkeys on the unicycles. And then you got the gorillas driving the go-karts. It is just tons of fun, isn't it? Total chaos, crazy. And you know what? You never know what's going to happen at the circus. You show up and you just are ready for whatever may happen. A lot of times, that's how the culture of the family is. The culture of the family is a lot like the culture of the circus. You never know what's going to happen. Everything's crazy. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at bringing a little bit of order to the craziness of family as we look at these messages uh, related to the family circus. We're going to be looking at relationships, marriage, family, parenting. And you know what? There's a word from God for every person that's here today. It doesn't matter what your relational status is. You may be single. You may be a high school student. You may be a widow or a widower. It just doesn't matter. You may be married. God's got a word for you. And here's the thing. The principles that we look at related to marriage and family trans transcend even just the family uh, environment. They relate to every area of life. And so no matter where you are, man, you just need to be here over the next few weeks. Today I want to talk about taming the beast of relational conflict because every family has some conflict. Every life has some conflict. Every relationship has a little conflict. And sometimes people think that conflict is bad, but did you know that conflict can be a good thing? You know, it's through conflict that we learn to be a little bit more humble. You know, we see kind of our own selfishness sometimes. And sometimes conflict uh, strengthens a bond between a husband and a wife. When you work through something, it actually can bring you closer together. So conflict in and of itself is not necessarily bad. But, but listen, if the conflict goes unresolved then a lot of other things can happen as well that can be negative and bad. So we want to deal with that today. We want to talk about this topic of taming the lions, conquering the beasts of relational conflict. And speaking of conflict, I, I was reminded of a few years ago, uh, I bought my wife a, a new car. She had a Honda Pilot. And I, uh, a week after we had purchased it, I jumped in the car. I went to a friend's house on Saturday morning, pulled into his driveway, picked something up, and started backing out, and I was trying to stay off of his grass, and in, in, in looking over the right side uh, of the car, looking over my right shoulder, I, I failed to see the cement pillar on the left side, and when I backed out, I, I smacked it with, my, with new car, man, just boom, hit that thing, and I thought at first maybe it was just a little love dent. I'm going to tell you, I just ripped the whole thing to shreds. I mean, it was bad. Brand new car. And, and, you know, I love those old school bumpers that were chrome, you know, because you could like bump into things all the time and it just didn't matter. But now everything's all painted and fiberglass and all that kind of stuff. And so when I got home and explained to my wife that her new car had been wrecked and that there was a thousand dollars worth of damage, we had some conflict. You could say that. Maybe you had some conflict before. You understand what I'm talking about. Conflict is, is inevitable. Whenever you bring two people together... There's always going to be a little conflict because you know what? Different people see things in different lights, different perspectives. People have conflict over money. You know, do we spend or do we save? Uh, people have conflict over in-laws. You know, how do we relate to the other family? Uh, people have conflict over intimacy. You know, husbands and wife argue and fight over that a lot. Uh, raising kids. You know, do, do we raise kids more like this or do we raise kids more like that? You were raised this way. I was raised this way. How do we raise our kids? Parenting styles. Uh, work is a source of conflict. Some spouses wish that their, that their husband or wife would work more and some wish they would work less. There's lots of conflict. So everywhere we look, there's things to, to have conflict over. We have different styles of dealing with conflict. There's the Green Beret style, which is like, Whenever I'm upset, I'm going to blow you away. I'm going to just, you know, come at you verbally, you know, like that. I'm going to let it rip. I'm not even going to think about what I'm going to say. I'm just going to let it all out. 
There's kind of that commando style, Green Beret style. Other people, though, when they have conflict, they become marathon runners. Just start running the other direction. I'm going to get as far away from this thing as I can. I don't want to talk about it. Don't bring it up. I'm going over here. Other people use the Eskimo approach. We'll just try and freeze them out. You know, there's a chill in the air. And then you hope that after like three or four months that things begin to thaw out just a little bit. People have so many different approaches. That's why we need a wisdom and a word from God. We need God's wisdom about how to resolve conflicts in relationships. And that's why I want you to take your Bibles today and open with me to the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. The Bible tells us some powerful principles today. I want to give you four primarily about dealing with the beast of relational conflict. And the Bible tells us, first of all, watch your time. Watch your time. Look at this in verse 26. Don't sin by letting anger control over you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for, it, for anger gives a mighty foothold to the devil. See, when the Bible says you got to deal with things when they come up. Don't let too much time elapse between the time that you're upset and then the time that things are resolved. Because what happens? What happens is that, that anger begins to grow and anger turns into bitterness. In fact, bitterness is anger that has been fermented. Do you know that? You just let some of that hostility and that anger, let it start to build up. And all of a sudden, bitterness, bitterness starts to come out of our lives. Bitterness. The Bible says, don't sin by letting anger gain control over you. And the way that anger grows, gains control over you is when it is not dealt with. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. And you know, when you get upset and you have unresolved conflict, your shoulders get all tight, can't sleep at night, feel sick at your stomach, you know, it's just a terrible feeling. Then you go and you call somebody else and start telling them about how upset you are with your spouse. And then you actually go and resolve that conflict, but then your friend or your family is still mad at your husband or your wife. And you're like, no, we worked it out. And they're like, yeah, but they messed with you. It would have been so much simpler to just have dealt with it on the front end. No. And the Bible says, settle, settle this wrath, settle anger before the sun goes down. I don't think that the Bible is necessarily saying that it has to be immediately, but it ought to be soon. It ought to be before too long. There is a time and a place to think. There's a time and a place to pray. There's a time and a place to kind of gather your thoughts, maybe read some scripture. There's a place for all that. But, but listen, at some point, we got to pull the trigger. we got to have those hard conversations, and we got to deal with the problems. Because if not, then, then we begin to move into bitterness. You know what bitterness is? Bitterness can be seen by how we keep record of wrongs. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us when we love people, when we have love, we don't keep records of wrongs. But you know, when you're sitting around thinking, you're upset, and you're like, oh, I remember in 2009 when you did this, you know. I remember January 31st, 2007, when you acted this way, and it was 4.39 p.m., but by the way, I'm not bitter about that. <laughs> Love keeps no record of wrong. Bitterness, when you're bitter, man, you keep record of everything. You got that, that mental list that's going on, and uh, it distorts our perception, doesn't it? You know, when you get angry and bitter, that can begins to consume you. You can't see straight. That person that you used to love and care about, and they could do no wrong in your eyes. Now you're looking through the lens of bitterness, and now all you see is what they do that is wrong. It begins to consume us, to help us understand this. I need a volunteer from the audience this morning. Okay, Latasha, come on up here. Let's give it up for Latasha. <laughs> Latasha. Come on up here, Latasha. I want you to put on these goggles. These are fatal vision impairment goggles. If you don't know what those are, they are goggles that do some funny things to your vision. In fact, they use these at high school assemblies and driver's ed classes to teach kids about what it's like to drive under the influence. And so you can be sober, but you can see some real funny things like you're under the influence. What are you seeing right now? Two of you. Two. All right. You're getting some double vision. All right, what I want you to do is I want you to, I'm going to help you because I, I want you to back up right here. I'm going to throw you a ball, but I want you to stand right here. Don't trip. Oh, don't break something. Yeah. We tried to put it away from the edge of the stage so you won't hurt yourself. What I want you to do with the fatal 
vision impairment goggles. I want you to catch this ball, okay? Ready? All right, I'm going to give you one more chance, Latasha, because I have a lot more confidence in you. Here we go. There we go. Okay, all right, I'm going to give you another chance. You see this line right here. I want you to walk the line, walk in a completely straight line by, while looking down at that line. Just see, just see if you can walk the line, straight line, with the, with the vision impairment, fatal vision impairment goggles. Here we go. All right, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Come on, let's give it up for Latasha. Good job. Good job. How about that? Now, when Latasha had on the goggles, she, she could see double. Everything was blurry. Things were not perceived as they really were, right? I mean, you could say that reality was out of focus and that her vision was distorted and that her perception was skewed. Would you not? And that's what bitterness does. You let anger stay in your heart before the sun goes down. You just let day after day after day. And then what happens, it begins to distort the way that you see. It's like a lens that you see the world through. That's why so many people who are miserable become more miserable. Because bitterness and anger is there. And so the Bible says the reason that we should not allow bitterness and anger is why? It says, it says there, verse 26 and 27, you give a foothold to the devil. You give a foothold to the devil. What is a foothold? A foothold is a place to stand. You give the devil a place to stand in your family when you have unresolved conflict, when you have anger. Now listen, raising kids and being married is challenging enough without the devil. Okay? We don't need to bring the devil into that to make it even worse. But that's what the Bible says. The devil is the master manipulator. He is the angel of light. He's the confuser. The Bible even describes him as the accuser of the brethren. So, so when we give a, a, a foothold, a place to stand to the devil, what he, he begins to take things, he begins to distort them, he begins to confuse us, and he begins to do so many other things that begin to damage the relationship. So we throw open the door to the enemy when we refuse to let go of old hurts and wounds, when we refuse to acknowledge that what we did was wrong. We refuse to uh, forgive others for what they did. We give the enemy footing and ground. We refuse to say, I'm sorry when we're wrong. Again, we're just giving, we're giving a place to stand to our lives. And so we choose to give the enemy a place in our minds and our emotions and we try to walk in the spirit and it just becomes so difficult because we've been subjugated to, to this distorted perception. Now, the word devil in the language of the New Testament is actually two words put together. And it's the Greek word diabolo. And the first part of that is one word and it's the word dia and it means through. And see, the devil is trying to get through to you. He's trying to penetrate your heart. He's trying to penetrate your life. So that he can mess up your family and your relationships. I love to say this. The devil is about division. It's about dividing people. He is, his goal is to drive a wedge in between people. And that's why people become fault finding and nitpicky. And, and, and things look worse many times than they really are. Because the devil is, has, a, has a foothold. He has a place to stand. In Ephesians chapter 6, a couple of chapters later, we see the, the classic passage about spiritual warfare that's going on. And we see the, the role of having a good place to stand. And uh, any fighter, any warrior knows that you've got to have firm footing if you're going to fight. So we've got to give firm footing to our lives by removing the footing of the enemy because... Because that's when he begins to mess with things. So how do we fix this problem? We watch the time. We settle the conflict in a, in a timely manner before it escalates into something else. Here's the second thing. Watch your words. Watch your words. Okay, watch the time and watch your words. Look at this in verse 29. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. 
And he says, don't let, don't let any unwholesome talk, but do let praiseworthy, uplifting, encouraging talk come out of your mouth. So there's a, there's a prohibition, don't do this, and then there's a command, do that. Now he says here, unwholesome talk. In other words, if you want to have a great family, if you want to have a great marriage, if you want to have great relationships, what's coming out of your mouth? You know, is, 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 is it profanity? Is it demeaning your partner? Is it belittling? Is, is, is that what's coming out of the mouth? If you're single today and you're thinking about marrying somebody, what, what are they saying? What are you saying back to that person? Because the words that we use will have a profound effect on the relationship that we end up having. So Paul says this, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouth. He says, but do this, build others up. And you notice it says they're according to their needs. You know, every spouse has a need. A man has a need. A woman has a need. A child has a need. So in the family, what, are, what is needed in the area of words? And if you're thinking, well, man, I don't know, study your spouse. You know, look at them. I mean, ask yourself the question, what builds them up? What encourages them? What blesses them? And then use those kind of words to build people up. There's some things that I might say to my spouse to build her up that might be different from somebody else's family. So study your spouse. Look at this. According to their needs. Build them up. And uh, husbands need words of respect. You know, men, men need to be respected. You want to get to a man's heart, show respect. Men love to be respected. You respect a man, you will begin to move the ball down the field in a great way in the family. Women, women love to be nurtured and loved. And if you're a man today and you're thinking, I want to build my wife up, but I'm not sure what to say, let me give you a start right here. Tell your wife that she's thin and beautiful. Okay? Oh, you will always score points with that. There is not a woman on the planet that doesn't want to be told that she's thin and beautiful. But don't do what I did a few years ago. I told my wife it looked like she had lost some weight. You know, and I really meant that as a compliment. And she looked back at me and she said, was I chunky before? <laughs> don't, don't do that, guys. Don't do that. Just you're thin and beautiful. You've always been thin. Words of praise. Words of encouragement. Words of blessing. See, when you get bitter, you hold back the praise. You see good things that your spouse is doing, and you don't want to compliment that because you're angry. You see, you withhold it. You withhold it, and you starve the marriage. You starve the relationship. So what words are we saying? Are we demeaning? Are we building up? Are we edifying? Are we blessing? Gina and I became friends with a couple a few years ago, and we met them. They were on uh, kind of the back end of, of going through an affair. The, the husband uh, had gotten involved with a, another woman, and they had moved cities to kind of get away from that situation. And uh, uh, we, were, we were good friends with them. This was a number of years ago. And they never really dealt with the situation. And so she would always put him down, even in front of us, and then he would argue back. Both of them, you know, were kind of involved in this. And, you know, to our surprise, after we moved to Colorado, we discovered that, that she had gone and had an affair on him, but that was the thing that she hated and was so mad that he had done to her. And I kept thinking in my own mind, when there's bitterness and there's anger and there's hostility, it will lead us to do things that we would not do normally. Things that don't make sense begin to be sensible when we haven't dealt with the issues. I wonder how many of us today are going through some, some problems we haven't dealt with the issues you got to get to the root of the problem. got to get down to the root of that problem because, because it is in that moment that healing and forgiveness and strength and power can come. And that's what we need. So what are the words that we're saying? Are we building up or are we tearing down? Are we building up or tearing down? we got to watch our words. we got to watch the time, and we've got to watch our hearts. The Bible gives us an and the exhortation for our hearts, that is to show compassion and forgiveness. Look at this in verse 32. Be kind to each other, tender-hearted. 
you ought to underline that. Forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Tender hearted. In other words, don't be harsh. You know, if you're a harsh person, oftentimes the root of that is bitterness and anger. Some people think that's just their personality. But you become bitter and angry, you'll be a harsh person. And we have to make distinct, uh, we have to distinguish our our work life, sometimes from our family life. Some of us are in jobs where we have to deal with a lot of conflict. And, and then we go home and we talk to our wives the same way that we talk to our coworkers or the people that work for us. We have to be able to change hats. We have to be able to put on the boss hat or the employee hat. And then we have to come home and we have to put on the husband hat and the father hat. And the father-husband hat is the hat of compassion. It's tenderness. See, when our lives are controlled by bitterness, we we don't have this. Watch your heart, the scripture says. Don't be harsh. And then he says, love one another or forgive one another as God through Christ has forgiven you. In other words, unconditional love. The cross of Jesus Christ is the greatest example of unconditional love that the world has ever seen. You want to see unconditional love, look at Jesus Christ. Jesus loves us without condition. You know, there's nothing that you could do today that would make God love you any more than he already does. And now the Bible says that we ought to love others in the way that Christ has loved us. It's unconditional. Unconditional. So in a marriage, many people care more about being right than having a good relationship. we got to let that go. We've got to let that go. Compassion and forgiveness should be the focus, not being right or having an agenda or, or, or being superior to somebody else. Forget about that stuff. Let's work, on, let's work on building the relationship. So are you a peacemaker or a peacebreaker? Peacemaker or peacebreaker? Are you provoking or are you peacemaking? And that's why we ought to pray for peace in the home. Really is. So, how's your heart, man? Watch your heart. The Bible says, watch your actions. Watch your actions. Don't, don't let anger escalate into sin. Look at this. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, verse 31 says, as well as all types of malicious behaviors. Why is that necessary? Well, if you go back to verse 26, it says, don't let anger control you. See, when you let these things, rage and anger and harsh words and slander, when you let that stuff settle in your heart, then anger turns into bitterness and bitterness turns into sin. Now, it's not wrong to be angry. In fact, did you know that God got angry a few times in the Bible? God is patient. God doesn't get angry a lot, but he does sometimes. And God gets angry about things that are righteous. There's a thing called righteous anger. Jesus exemplified this when he was cleansing the temple in the Gospels. He said, you've taken my house of prayer and you've turned it into a den of thieves. Jesus was angry. So you can be angry about injustices, about about abuse, about lying, about poverty, about racism, about a number of things. We ought to be angry about those kinds of things. But listen, we should never let anger turn into sin. There's a difference. You can be angry, but is that anger going to lead you to make choices and decisions that are not godly? I remember one moment when anger had just consumed me. I was a high school student. I was playing some high school basketball. I was on the junior varsity that year. And our team had the ball, and we were running a fast break. One of my teammates had the ball. I was running up the court. And there was a guy that was guarding me, and I was guarding him. And we were all over each other. I mean, I had known this guy for for three or four years. We had played against each other in middle school and now, you know, in high school. And I I didn't care much for him. He probably didn't care much for me. We were elbowing each other. And we were, you know, we were playing as physical basketball as you could play without getting a technical foul, you know. Just to, just to kind of put it in light. And uh, the guy was running backwards as I was running forward up the court. Our team, again, had the ball. And the guy fell down. He fell on his back like this. And I was so angry. The ref was looking the other direction. You know what I did? I kept running, and I stepped on the guy's face. Is that awful? That's, like, really bad. This wasn't football. This was basketball, you know? Oh, my goodness. The guy got up. He had Nike Air right on his nose, man. Right here. 
My coach called a timeout a few months later, and my teammates were like, Ryan, you stepped on the guy's face. I was like, man, I was angry. Sometimes anger will lead us to do things that we would not do normally. Anger will lead us to sin if it's not resolved. Watch your actions. Don't let the anger continue to boil over the top. Don't, don't, don't let it continue to escalate because it will lead you down a path of destruction. Lead you down that path. That's why Hebrews 12 says this. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. I love that idea, the root of bitterness. When I think about the root of bitterness, I think about my yard. I love to have a green, green, healthy, dynamic, vibrant yard. So important to me. We moved into a new house last summer and the yard was a wreck. And I tell you, it just totally stressed me out for weeks. Until I could get that thing in order. There were weeds everywhere. And I'm like a dandy a dandelion patrolled Nazi, you know, and I see dandelions, I'm like killing everything. I remember a few years ago, I had a neighbor that was, he was the only guy on the street that didn't keep his yard. My yard's cut, it's watered, it's fertilized. If I get one dandelion, you know, we're on it. I'm digging the thing out by the roots and all that. This one guy, he's letting his yard go. Finally, one night I was so frustrated, I actually put on my camos from H&M. And I went next door with a little shovel and a flashlight, and I started digging up his weeds because, you know what, his seeds were getting in my yard. And he was the one guy that wasn't keeping his yard. He was messing up the whole block. That's why you can't ever let one dandelion grow in your yard. If you think, I'm just going to let it grow over there in the corner, just a nice, you know, large, oversized dandelion. It doesn't work that way. Because where you got one dandelion, you got lots of little brothers and sisters. They're all running around all over the yard. My kids love to, you know, to pick those and blow the seeds everywhere. I'm like, stop! (laughs) Don't do it! And when you got a dandelion, you can't just pick the leaves off. You got to get down in the ground and get to the root. You got to work that thing. That's how bitterness is. Sometimes to get rid of bitterness in your heart, you got to do some work. You can't just pluck the leaves off. You know what? It'll come back stronger, come back bigger, won't it? Bitterness is anger that has been fermented. It's anger that's just fermented and month after month and year after year. It's just growing and growing and growing. And it'll take over your whole yard and it'll take over your whole heart, take over your life. That's why we've got to do what the writer of Hebrews says. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. You know what? That root gets in you, it begins to destroy. It's poison. It's poison. That's why Jesus said in the Gospels that we should forgive 70 times 7. Jesus wasn't talking about forgiving someone 490 times. Jesus understood there were, there were experiences and there are times in life when we go through circumstances that are very difficult And forgiveness is not something that we just say a little prayer or have a little conversation. We just get over it. Sometimes we can, but other times we've been hurt. We've been wounded. We've been lied to. We've been abused. We've been mistreated. And you know what? Every day when you get out of bed, you may need to pray to God that he would give you the strength to forgive. Because forgiveness is not just this one-time deal. It's this process that goes on and on and on. And you know what? If you'll continue to dig down and grab the roots... God will bring freedom in your life. He will. But it may take some time. And it may take some energy. And it may take a little work. And ultimately, as a parent, we don't want to pass on our bitterness to the next generation. See, our kids oftentimes turn out to do and to say and to believe the same things that we do. So you show me a cynical parent or a skeptical parent, a lot of times you'll have a cynical, skeptical kid. You have a bitter parent... The kids will pick up on that. Kids will become bitter. And it gets passed on from generation to generation to generation. Hebrews says, get down to the root, pull the root out, and see what God will do. See what God will do. You know, back to this spiritual thing we were talking about a minute ago about giving the devil a foothold. Did you know a lot of marriages, a lot of marriages think that the problems are communication problems or personality problems or 
differences of opinions or man-woman problems. And that's true that those exist in marriages. But could it be today that you're facing a spiritual problem? And sometimes we talk about all the emotional stuff and we totally forget about the spiritual side of things. And I wonder how many times that we've got spiritual problems, but we're looking for little surface answers and solutions. We need God. We need the power of Jesus in our lives. We've got to watch our words. And we've got to watch our, the timing. We've got to watch our actions and our hearts. So here's a question this morning. Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to forgive? Proverbs 14, 29 says, Those who control their anger have a great understanding, and those with hasty tempers will make mistakes. See, unresolved anger develops into bitterness. It mutates. It cultivates an environment for anger to germinate. What happens? Now, the family is a circus. It is the greatest show on earth. Relationships are crazy. And you know what? They can also be a lot of fun. <laughs> Just like the circus. The circus is crazy, but it can be tons of fun. Your family, your marriage, your relationships can be crazy, but they can be a huge blessing when God is in control and when bitterness and anger is not ruling and dominating our hearts. That's why we got to watch our time, watch our words, watch our heart, and watch our actions. And in doing so, we can keep a handle on the greatest show on earth, and we can stop living under the influence of bitterness.